all of you to the 62nd Shofal oration or 12th Shofal oration of the Shofal 3 series on the annual theme of Integrated Maritime Studies. Today we are extremely privileged to have amongst us one of the most um, eminent speaker, Dr. Niru Chadha, who happens to be the judge in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So we have also amongst us the distinguished chancellor of this university, Professor Dr. Amit Banarji. I welcome you, ma'am, and I welcome you, sir. Along with this, we have got international students almost from 35 countries spanning Asia and Africa. We have also domestic students from different parts of the country. We have faculties, NSS volunteers, NSS program officers, senior officials from the university, dear students, and also our outside audience. This is a very important moment for all of us that today's speaker, Dr. Niru Chadha, Madam Justice, kindly accepted our invitation and she has agreed to deliver the today's oration on responsibility of states to protect marine environment, contribution of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Niru Chadha to the audience. Dr. Niru Chadha is a judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea since October 1, 2017 and is presently also the president of the Seaway Disputes Chamber of the Tribunal. Prior to that, she served as the chief legal advisor in the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. She has also served as the legal advisor in the Permanent Mission of India to the United Nations. Dr. Chadha has represented the Government of India in various multilateral and bilateral negotiations on various issues of international law. She also served as the agent of the Government of India in its maritime delimitation dispute with Bangladesh. In the case concerning the Enrica Lakshi incident with Italy and in the case concerning nuclear disarmament with the Marshall Islands. She also served as a co-agent in the Kishanganj arbitration with Pakistan. On behalf of the university, I welcome you, ma'am. And now I request our Chancellor, Professor Dr. Amit Banarji, sir, to kindly address the audience briefly, sir. Uh, very good evening. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, very good evening. It is a, it is a great privilege to have with us this evening, Professor Niru Chadha, uh, you know, who is a role model uh, and an inspiration for many women lawyers and judges in and around India and the world, and being a recipient of the coveted Nari Shakti Award, which is the uh, the highest civilian award for women in this country. Uh, she is in the top rung of people who is there to inspire not just people in the judiciary or in the legal ecosystem, but women uh, in all spheres of life. And uh, she has, uh, you know, she has the distinction of having made significant contributions to the development and interpretation of the maritime law. And as you know, today we are we are in the uh, ecosystem of discussing maritime affairs in this series of so for lectures. So very happily she is with us this afternoon, and uh, especially in relation to the rights and obligations of the states, the protection and preservation of the maritime environment, and the settlement of disputes, as Professor Sharma has already pointed out, arising from various uh, maritime-related concerns. Uh, she is widely respected for her fairness, integrity, and competence in the field of international law and justice. Uh, so. Uh, without uh, standing between the honorable speaker, I request uh, her ladyship, uh, Honorable Justice Niru Chadda, to, uh, to please begin her uh, uh, discussions and please be begin her presentations for this uh, uh, so often lecture of today's afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 
and as rightly pointed out by our chancellor now how eagerly this lecture has been awaited can be a uh, testament to the kind of presence we have nearly 450 um odd, uh, uh, audience consisting of all, all, already almost 450 person so i request you madam to kindly deliver the 60 second oration Madam, Madam, are you there, Madam? I am so PPT for event. I hope her mic is not muted or her video is not muted. Can you just cross check from your end, please? Um, so, sir, we are just uh, waiting for the connectivity kind of thing. Hope it will be okay. set all right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I hope you are able to speak to her online. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. No, no issues. There may be, you know, a little technical glitch. I uh, will get over it. That's right, sir. Sir, sir. Because, you know, this is a long awaited uh, uh, oration. Long -awaited event yeah. and so many persons have joined, sir. And let me share with you that it is not just the 450 people who have joined. Uh, I understand there are many of uh, people in the clusters, you know, where they have got only one system working, but there are several people sitting, you know, waiting to listen to her. So I think it is worth the wait for a few seconds by the time the technical problem is uh, sorted out. You know, there is okay. no problem. Okay, sir. Madam, can you please log out and then can log in? Okay. 
प्लीज लॉग आउट एंड देन लॉग इन यस यस प्लीज यस प्लीज ज्वाइन मैडम प्लीज ज्वाइन just just to wait why after i think a ah, list of attendees list of attendees i have clicked but why it is after e h then i then automatically why k is there where j is not coming i don't oh sometimes it doesn't so acha just wait ma'am because ai join kori chanti ना ना से अल्फाबेटिकली देखौनी से कहौ छथि से देखु छथि बोले हमरो कोन 450 देखाउ छै माने 500 पिला जॉइन करलेनी ना 500 कोटी देखौ छै माने जे तो बिल्कुल नाही आब कोन बाटो अछि इज देयर एनी अदर वे Uh, no, why name is not coming? Oh, in the participant list, name is showing. You panso na pura tamar dekhu chogi panso na. Panso dus. Kya kya? Je to bilkul more thi dekhu nahi. पूरा Yes, ma'am. Go highlight for that. Spot it. No problem. In front of the table. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. I'm on the line now. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please, ma'am. Please. Sorry. Sorry for the technical glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone, and I thank Chancellor Banerjee as well as Mr. Sh uh, Professor Sharma for your very kind words. I am really very pleased to participate in this so-called oration series, and thank Sik Siksha Varnusandhan for this opportunity. The topic of my paper is responsibility of states to protect marine environment, contribution of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. 
the topic is very wide and the audience is diverse so i have tried to put my presentation simply and succinctly to make its essence comprehensible so that non law persons if any in this gathering do not have much difficulty in understanding before i elaborate on uh, the jurisprudence of international tribunal of law of the sea let me recall for you very very briefly that law of the sea has developed over several centuries concluding in the 1982 united nations convention on the law of the sea and several related instruments here in after i'll refer to the convention as convention or unclause the convention addresses and governs all aspects of ocean space from the allocation of jurisdiction in various maritime zones the equitable and efficient utilization of marine resources the study protection and preservation of marine environment delimitation of maritime boundaries scientific research commerce and settlement of international disputes today since we are talking about protection of marine environment it is important to recall why oceans are important for us the oceans are of course important as they connect and sustain us the resources and uses of oceans are fundamental to human well-being and development it needs to be highlighted that while nearly half of the world's human populations lives within 100 miles of a coast all of us depend on the ocean and the resources it provides whether it be for oxygen we breathe or the food we eat it is estimated that more than 3.5 billion people depend on the ocean for their primary source of food which is the fish estimates show that oceans not only produce half of the world's oxygen but also serve as an air filtering device absorbing nearly one third of human caused carbon dioxide emissions the oceans also play a major role in the freshwater cycle forming the clouds that bring us rain which replenish our freshwater supplies as you all are aware ocean bound shipping accounts for more than 90% of global trade the oceans lie at the heart of global telecommunication system hosting around 1 million kilometer of fiber optic cables that carry more than 98% of international internet data video and telephonic traffic ocean related industries such as shipping fishing and tourism provide jobs and revenue to the states the deep sea realm has also immense economic potential in the form of minerals energy and living resources it is therefore quite evident that long term sustainability of oceans is critical and any change that alters the state of oceans can have serious social economic consequences we these days attach great importance to the development or expansion of an ocean based economy the oft mentioned term blue economy refers to the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth improve livelihoods and jobs while at the same time preserving the health of the ocean ecosystems these are also the three dimensions of sustainable development the oceans are exposed to various human induced changes that are deleterious not only to human health but to all living resources this was recognized by the united nations convention on the law of the sea way back in 1982 in how it defined pollution and i quote pollution means the introduction of man directly or indirectly of substances or energy into the marine environment which results or is likely to result in such deleterious effects as to harm living resources hazards to human health hindrance to marine activities including fishing impairment of quality for use of sea water and reduction of amenities these days the most immediate and pressing risk to the ocean arises from climate change the oceans have a critical role in regulating the earth's climate 
as they absorb the extra energy trapped in the climate system, as well as a large amount of the carbon waste we emit into the atmosphere. As a consequence of increase in greenhouse gas emissions, the oceans are warming and expanding. Their chemical composition is changing, leading to sea level rise, ocean acidification, and adverse impact on the marine ecosystem and biodiversity. In this regard, I want to bring to your attention an important development. In, the, in August 2022, the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law decided to request an advisory opinion from the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea on two questions, which are what are the specific obligations of state parties to the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, including Part 12, which relates to marine environment, to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment in relation to the deleterious effects that result or are likely to result from climate change, including through ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification, which are caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And also, what are the obligations of state parties to protect and preserve the marine environment in relation to climate change impacts, including ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification? In this case, state parties and the relevant international organizations have filed their written submissions before the tribunal. And the oral proceedings are scheduled to commence from 11 September to 2023. Since the matter is under consideration of the tribunal, in which our pylons we call sub judice I want to issue a disclaimer that I will only be addressing the jurisprudence of the tribunal in the cases which have already been decided and then, and my comments should not be seen in the context of the pending advisory opinion. For the benefit of those who are not familiar with the dispute settlement mechanism of the convention, I want to submit that the tribunal is a permanent court created by the convention as part of its compulsory third party dispute settlement system. The compulsory mechanism as embodied embodied in part 15 is perhaps one of the most important and innovative features of the convention dispute settlement system. The tribunal, the tribunal is entrusted by the convention with the authority to settle disputes concerning the interpretation and application of the law of the sea. However, it may be noted that the tribunal is only one of the four forums available to parties to a dispute under article 287 of the convention. Through a written declaration, the parties may also choose the International Court of Justice or arbitration in accordance with Annex 7 and Annex 8 of the Convention. If the parties to the dispute have not previously made a choice or have not chosen the same means of dispute settlement, arbitration in accordance with Annex 7 of the Convention applies as the default compulsory means of settlement of disputes. However, despite the fact that tribunal is only one of the forum and not the default mode, the convention confers on the tribunal certain exclusive and special functions. These relate to the residual jurisdiction in prompt release cases, the jurisdiction to entertain, entertain requests for provisional measures pending the constitution of an arbitral tribunal under Annex 7, the exclusive jurisdiction of the seabed disputes chamber of the tribunal regarding disputes and requests for advisory opinions related to the international seabed regime. And there is an authority vested in the president of the tribunal by Annex 7 to appoint arbitrators to an arbitral of a party and in consultation with both parties. It should also be noted that jurisdiction of the tribunal also extends to disputes arising from agreements other than the convention, as long as they confer jurisdiction on the tribunal. Article 21 of the Statute of the Tribunal stipulates that its jurisdiction comprises all matters specifically provided for in any other agreement which confers jurisdiction on the tribunal. The advisory opinion of the tribunal on request from Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission in 2015 which I'll be coming to later, 
was conducted with was rendered under this provision similarly the pending advisory opinion on climate change is also submitted under this provision it may also be noted that the newly adopted agreement on uh, biological biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction also confers by this advisory jurisdiction on that tribunal coming back to marine environment i will very briefly outline the provisions of the convention relating to preservation and protection of marine environment and then focus on the cases which have arisen before that tribunal one of the goals of the convention as stated in its preamble is to establish a legal order for the seas and oceans which will promote inter alia the equitable and efficient utilization of their resources the conservation of their living resources and the study protection and preservation of the marine environment in this regard part 12 of the convention is a crucial component of the legal regime detailing the provisions on protection and preservation of the marine environment there are significant provisions relating to protection of marine environment in other parts of the convention for example on the exploitation of living resources in the exclusive economic zone that is the eez and on the high seas in articles on the exploitation of the resources of the deep sea bed and in annex 3 on basic conditions of prospecting exploration and exploitation of deep sea bed minerals these provisions establish a comprehensive framework for the protection and preservation of marine environment article 192 is the first provision found in part 12 and establishes the general obligation of states to protect and preserve the marine environment in the south china sea arbitration the annex 7 tribunal had defined that article 192 of the convention all the in general terms does impose a duty on states parties the content of which is informed by the other provisions of part the protection of the marine environment from future damage and preservation in the sense of maintaining or improving its present condition article 192 does entail a positive obligation to take active measures to protect and preserve the marine environment and by logical implication and tells the negative obligation not to degrade the marine environment the tribunal also clarified that obligations under part 12 apply to all states with respect to the marine environment in all maritime areas both inside the national jurisdictions of state and beyond it the content of the general obligation in article 192 is further detailed in the subsequent provisions of part 12 as well as by reference to specific obligational agreements national agreements as envisaged in article 237 of the convention states have entered into many international agreements that address specific aspects of marine environment protection and preservation the convention does not attempt to replace them rather provides that specific obligations under those conventions should be carried out in a manner consistent with general principles and objectives of this convention article 193 of the convention indicates that states have the sovereign right to exploit their natural resources so long as they do so in accordance with their duty to protect and preserve the marine environment article 194 of the convention concretizes the general principles under 192 and 193 into more specific obligations of states paragraph 1 enjoin states to take all measures that are necessary to prevent reduce and control pollution of marine environment from any source paragraph 2 stipulates that if states have the responsibility to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states or of areas beyond the limits of national jurisdiction paragraph 3 of article 194 provides that the measures taken by states shall deal with all sources of pollution these provisions indicate that neither the place of origin nor the source changes the obligation of states to prevent reduce and control marine pollution 
here, I want to underline that part well of the convention should not be seen to be limited to measures aimed at controlling marine pollution only. This was affirmed by the annex far from equating the preservation of marine environment with pollution control. The tribunal noted that para 5 of Article 194 expressly provides that the measures taken in accordance with this part shall include those necessary to protect and preserve rare or fragile ecosystems as well as the habitat of depleted, threatened, or endangered species and other forms of marine life. Seven requires states to cooperate on a global or regional basis directly or through competent international organizations in formulating and elaborating international rules, standards, and recommended practices and procedures in of marine environment, taking into account characteristic regional features. Further, under these articles, the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment must be undertaken in a way that does not pose risk to other environments. Thus, states have a duty not to transfer damage or hazards from one area to another or transform one type of pollution into another. They may not use technologies that may introduce alien or new species into the marine environment that may cause significant or harmful changes to that environment. States are obliged to notify other states when they determine that they are in danger of damage from pollution, establish contingency plans against pollution, and, uh, and undertake scientific research and exchange of information regarding the pollution of marine, of marine environment. States are also obliged to monitor the risks and effects of marine pollution and to publish the results of these studies. These all duties are mentioned from Article 195 to Article 205 of the Convention. The Convention also requires states to make studies of the potential effects of activities that may present substantial risks to the marine environment in order to assess those risks which are the environmental impact assessments. They are obliged to publish the results of those studies and make them available to all interested states and international organizations. This is provided in Article 206 of the Convention. Part 12 of the Convention does not contain any explicit reference to the precautionary approach or principle, but this notion is said to be reflected in Article 206 on environmental impact assessment. The convention goes on to address state-specific duties with respect to pollution from land posts, sources, from seabed activities, from resource development of the deep seabed, from dumping from vessels, and from or through the atmosphere. These articles complement the general obligation of states to protect and preserve the marine environment set out in Articles 192 through 206 by codifying the relation Ship between states' rights to establish and enforce standards of behavior and the applicable international norms. I will now present some cases on environment related issues that have been dealt by the International Tribunal for Law of the Sea. These cases have arisen in the context of provisional measures jurisdiction of the tribunal under Article 290 of the Convention and its advisory jurisdiction. The Tribunal has provided a number of important clarifications regarding the obligation of states to protect and preserve marine environment under the Convention. The Southern Bluefin tuna cases. These cases were brought by Australia and New Zealand against Japan, alleging over-exploitation of the southern bluefin tuna fish stocks. Though this was a case under part seven of the convention relating to the conservation and management of the living resources of the high seas, the tribunal stated preservation of the marine environment. The fact that there was, fact that there was agreement between the parties that the stock of southern bluefin tuna was severely depleted, which was a cause for serious concern. It also held that the parties should in the circumstances act with prudence and caution to ensure 
that effective conservation measures are taken to prevent serious harm to the stock of southern bluefin tuna. It was the first instance of an international judgment using the notion of precaution and precaution and caution, albeit indirectly. The tribunal in this case also highlighted that states' parties have a duty to cooperate directly or through appropriate international organizations with a view to ensuring conservation and promoting the objective of optimum utilization of the stock of highly migrated species. The second case, which I'll be referring is the Hawks Plant case between Ireland and United Kingdom, where the tribunal set out the threshold for invoking the precautionary approach, as well as elements of cooperation between the states. Mocks involved a dispute over marine pollution between the United Kingdom and Ireland, in which Ireland requested the tribunal through its provisional measures jurisdiction to, to restrain the United Kingdom from the operation of the Mox plant because of the potential danger of radioactive leaks and emissions arising from the operation of the plant or resulting from industrial accidents, terrorist attacks, or other causes, that could, that could cause irreversible consequences. Since this was a provisional measures case under Article 290, Paragraph 5 of the Convention, which gives jurisdiction to the tribunal to prescribe provisional measures if the urgency of the situation so demands till the setting up of an Annex 7 tribunal, the tribunal emphasized that it is necessary first to establish the seriousness and imminence of the potential harm to the marine environment. The tribunal ruled that Ireland had failed to meet the necessary threshold in demonstrating the urgency and the seriousness of the potential harm requiring the prescription of provisional measures requested by Ireland in the short period before the constitution of the Annex 7 Tribunal. However, invoking its power to prescribe different provisional measures than those requested by the parties, the tribunal held that the, due to, the duty to cooperate is a fundamental principle in the prevention of pollution of the marine environment under Part 12 of the Convention and general international law, and that arise, arise from these duties. The tribunal held that prudence and caution require that Ireland and the United Kingdom cooperate in exchanging information concerning the risks or effects of the operation of the MOX plant and in devising ways to deal with them. According to the tribunal, accordingly, sorry, the tribunal directed that Ireland and the United Kingdom shall cooperate and shall for this purpose enter into consultations both with in order to exchange further information with regard to possible, co cause, possible consequences for the IEC arising out of the commissioning of the MOX plant, monitor risks or the effects of the operation of the MOX plant for the IEC, and devise as appropriate measures to prevent pollution of the marine environment, which might result from the operation of the MOX plant. This duty was again highlighted in the case of land reclamation in and around the Straits of Johor. In this case, the dispute concerned the land reclamation activities carried out by Singapore, which Malaysia alleged was causing serious and irreversible damage to the marine environment and serious prejudice to the rights of Malaysia. Citing lack of cooperation between the parties, the tribunal held that given the possible implications of land reclamation on marine environment, prudence and caution require that Malaysia and Singapore establish mechanisms for exchanging information and assessing the risks or effects of land reclamation works and devising ways to deal with them in the areas concerned. It also directed Singapore not to conduct its land reclamation in ways that might cause irreparable prejudice to the rights of Malaysia or serious harm to the marine environment, taking into account the reports of the group of independent experts. The tribunal also prescribed as a provisional measure that the parties establish a group of independent experts with specific mandate to propose measures adequate to deal with any adverse effects of the land reclamation work started by Singapore. 
as directed, the parties established the expert group and concluded an agreement relying on the measures proposed by it and declared that the agreement contained the final settlement of the dispute. The dispute thus was solved without further proceeding on the merits. These principles were further confirmed and elaborated by the Seabed Disputes Chamber of the Tribunal in its advisory opinion on responsibilities and obligation of states sponsoring persons and entities with respect to activities in the area. The Seabed Disputes Chamber of the Tribunal through its advisory and contentious jurisdiction has the exclusive jurisdiction of interpreting part 11 of the convention and the relevant annexes and regulations that form the legal basis for organization and management of activities in the area. So here, when I'm referring to the area, it's the area with the capital A. And to recall for your benefit briefly, part 11 of the convention sets out a detailed regime for exploration and exploitation of the deep, deep seabed and its resources in area beyond national jurisdiction. The International Seabed Authority, which is established under Part 11, has the mandate to organize and control deep seabed mining in the seabed area beyond national jurisdiction for the benefit of mankind as a whole. The authority has a mandate to ensure the effective protection of the marine environment from harmful effects that may arise from deep seabed related activities. In carrying out its functions, Amongst other things, the authority is empowered to award contracts to state and non-state entities, allowing them to prospect, explore, and exploit minerals from the deep seabed in exchange for payment of royalties and other fees. Towards that end, ISBA has adopted a comprehensive set of rules, regulations, and procedures within the general legal framework established by the convention, in particular, its Part 11 on the area, and its 1994 agreement relating to implementation of Part 11 of the Convention. In other terms, ISA's licensing regime, activities in the area may be carried out by state parties to the Convention or by state entities or natural or juridical person which possess the nationality of state parties or are effectively controlled by them or their nationals when sponsored by such state. Therefore, non-state actors such as private corporations seeking to participate within this regime must obtain sponsorship from all states of which they are nationals. You will recall that India is a five-year investor and is holding two licenses for expl uh, exploration of polymetal uh, polymetallic nodules as well as uh, sulfides. So the Council uh, of the International Seabed Authority sought an advisory opinion of the Seabed Disputes Chamber on the limits of state liability when a contractor that the state is sponsoring to explore ex or exploit the seabed in areas beyond national jurisdiction causes damage or harm. The questions before the chamber essentially were that what are the legal responsibilities and obligation of state parties to the convention with respect to sponsorship of activities in the area? What is the extent of liability of a state party for any failure to comply with the applicable law by an entity whom the state party has sponsored? And finally, what are the necessary and appropriate measures that a sponsoring state must take in order to fulfill its responsibi uh, responsibility under the applicable law? So this opinion addresses a number of important issues that bring from the analysis of the environmental obligation of states under Part 11 of the Convention and the content of due diligence obligation in the context of activities in the area. The main provisions of the Convention regarding these obligations, which are elaborated in Article 139, Article 153, Paragraph 4, and Annex 3, Article 4, Paragraph 4 of the Convention. These specify that the obligation of the sponsoring state is to ensure that the activities in the area conducted by the sponsored contractor are in conformity or in compliance with the relevant rules. And sponsoring state is not liable for damage caused by any failure of a contractor sponsored by it to comply with its obligations, 
if that state party has adopted laws and regulations and taken administrative measures which are within the framework of its legal system and are reasonably appropriate for securing compliance by persons under its jurisdiction. The chamber in this case opined that responsibility to ensure points to an obligation of the sponsoring state under international law. It clarified the scope of this obligation and opined that sponsoring states obligation to ensure is not an obligation to achieve in each and every case the result that the sponsored contractor complies with the aforementioned obligations. Rather, it is an obligation to deploy adequate means to exercise best possible efforts to do the utmost to obtain this result. To utilize the, term, uh, the terminology which is current in international law, the chamber characterized this obligation as an obligation of conduct and not of result, and as an obligation of due diligence. Drawing on the decision of the International Court of Justice in Pulp Mills on the River Uruguay, the chamber further clarified the connection between the obligations of due diligence and of conduct and held that in, it involves an obligation to adopt regulatory or administrative measures and a certain level of vigilance in the enforcement and the exercise of administrative control. As regards the precise nature and scope of the due diligence obligation of a state party, the chamber noted that it is difficult to describe as it will vary depending on the particular activity or the development of new scientific or technological knowledge over time. For this reason, the chamber refrained from elaborating on the precise nature of the level of due diligence required, other than to indicate that the standard of due diligence is more severe for activities involving higher environmental risks. For instance, in the present context of deep sea bed mining, the chamber held Prospecting for minerals is generally less risky than exploitation of these minerals. And therefore, the standard of due diligence in the case of the former would be less onerous than the standard for the later. In addition to these obligations, which it called primary obligations of due diligence, the chamber identified further direct obligations which are incumbent on sponsoring states under the convention which they have to comply independently of the obligation to ensure a certain behavior by the sponsored contractor. These obligations, these are the direct obligation of state parties, are the obligations to assist the authority in the exercise of control over activities in the area, the obligation to apply a precautionary approach, the obligation to apply best environmental practices, the obligation to take measures to ensure the provisions of guarantees in the event of an emergency order by the authority for protection of the marine environment, the obligation to ensure the availability of recourse for compensation in respect of damage caused by pollution, and the obligation to conduct environmental impact assessments. So I'll now come to another uh, advisory opinion in 2015. The International Tribunal for Law of the Sea delivered its first advisory opinion. The advisory opinion uh, of the Seabed Dispute Chamber uh, was in 2011, which was Seabed Dispute Chamber, as I told you, is a separate chamber of the tribunal. And for the whole tribunal, this was the first case for advisory opinion in response to the questions submitted by state parties to the VUS. West Africa Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission. This opinion clarified a number of important issues regarding the obligation of flag states to control the activities of their vessels conducting fishing activities in the exclusive economic zones of other states and their potential liability for failure to do this effectively. This opinion clarifies the scope of course states' jurisdiction over foreign vessels in the exclusive economic zone on the basis of its sovereign rights over living resources, 
in order to determine what activities and which vessels come within this regulatory power. As you are aware, fishing is no longer simply a process that involves fishing vessels catching fish, but also involves bunkering, transshipment, and resupply services, which allow fishing vessels to stay at sea for months at a time. So the question was, do they all fall within the regulatory authority of a coastal state in the exclusive economic zone? As you see, the tribunal had several questions before it. I will not go in their detail now, as they are beyond the scope of the present presentation. But briefly, the tribunal found that in the light of special rights and responsibilities of the coastal states in the exclusive economic zone, the primary responsibility for taking the necessary measures to prevent, deter, and eliminate IUU fishing rests with the coastal state. It is the coastal state's responsibility to adopt necessary laws and regulations, including enforcement procedures consistent with the convention to conserve and manage the living resources in the EEZ. The fishing activities that, the, that a coastal state may regulate consistent with Article 62 of the convention must be directly connected to fishing. In relation to obligations of flag state, it opined that pursuant to Article 94 of the Convention, the flag state is required to adopt the necessary administrative measures to ensure that fishing vessels flying its flag are not involved in activities which will undermine the flag state's responsibilities under the Convention in respect of the conservation and management of marine living resources. In this regard, the tribunal recalled that Article 192 of the Convention imposes on all states, parties, an obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment. And under Article 193, states have the sovereign right to exploit their natural resources pursuant to their environmental policies and in accordance with their duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. The Tribunal held as Article 192 applies to all maritime areas, including those encompassed by the exclusive economic zones. The Tribunal, relying on the Southern Blue Fin Tuna case, held that flag state is under an obligation to ensure compliance by vessels flag its flags with the relevant conservation measures concerning living resources which are enacted by the coastal state for its exclusive economic zone, because such measures constitute an integral element in the protection and preservation of the marine environment. So, a brief overview of some rulings and advisory opinions of the tribunal and its seabed disputes chamber has demonstrated that the tribunal has contributed significantly in clarifying the scope and content of the obligation of states to preserve and protect the marine environment by emphasizing the importance of the precautionary approach, environment impact assessments, and application of best environment practices. The consideration of conservation measures concerning living resources as an integral element in the protection and preservation of marine environment recognizes the interconnectedness of the marine ecosystem. The duty to cooperate and report has been considered, considered fundamental in cases involving transboundary disputes. The clarification of due diligence obligations adds precision and specificity to the duties of states in specific situations, thereby providing criteria for determining and securing, compliment, securing compliance by states' parties. To conclude, I have to say that the jurisprudence of the tribunal in environmental matters is set to keep pace with the progressive development of the law of the sea. And as one comment, as one comment, commentator puts it, the tribunal has demonstrated its willingness to interpret and apply part 12 of the convention consistently with the contemporary state of international environment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am.
Thank you very much for your detailed deliberation on the responsibility of states to protect marine environment. Contribution of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. With your permission, we can take few questions, ma'am. Sure. Uh, the first question uh, is from my side. Uh, we know that uh, uh, a coastal state can protect uh, its marine interest up to 12 nautical uh, miles. Now, my question is that if there is a landlocked country, uh, does he possess any responsibility to protect marine environment? Because uh, uh, is there is a landlocked country is also entitled for any uh, marine resources or marine opportunities? Give me a minute so that I can write your question. Yes, ma'am. Should I repeat it? No, it's okay. Okay, okay, ma'am. See, for the landlocked countries, uh, as regards as the natural resources are concerned, the fishing, sometimes they get. Your voice is breaking, madam. Your voice is not audible. Madam, you are not audible. Uh, you are not audible. Not audible. Madam, you are not audible. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Now you are audible. Uh. He is a general right and they, they as such there is a right uh, landlocked states as you are aware need access to the sea by means of transit through one or more neighboring coastal states without this right of access Landlocked states would not be able to exercise their rights. So as you are aware, we have a transit agreement uh, with Nepal, which is one of our neighboring countries, uh, landlocked countries. So freedom of transit through the territory of transit states by all means of transport is a right which is given to landlocked states. As such, uh, apart from freedom of transit, other rights have to be secured through agreements. This, as you were talking about exploitation of living resources, this right is not direct and is subject to certain provisions of uh, the convention. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, a state, uh, uh, a coastal state has the right to exploit its natural resources. And if only there is a surplus, it can give a right to other states to exploit natural resources in their uh, exclusive economic zone. So this would, as I told you earlier, would be dependent on the agreements between a coastal state as well as uh, the landlocked state. But as far as the high seas are concerned, you know, so if uh, landlocked states are uh, fishing in the high seas for natural resources, they will, of course, like other uh, state parties, uh, have to comply with all the regulations, environmental regulations, and other uh, requirements which are there in the law of the sea. Uh, thank you, ma'am. But one thing, uh, does the coastal state is bound to have a, a relationship or some kind of understanding with the landlocked country? Or is it a mutual understanding kind of thing? See, as far as transit uh, is rights are concerned, uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is uh, it is a right. So you can say that that uh, uh, it is uh, okay. 
I think my voice goes away in in between. So this right has is then dependent. What kind of right is there is dependent on the agreement between the coastal state and the or the country through which the transit right is to be given. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And there are two questions in the chat box, uh, ma'am. Uh, just I am reading out, uh, yes. madam. How India is involved in South China Sea, and what is China's stance on the South China dispute? Um, see, I will not be in a position uh, to answer any political question. Yes, yes, I I was also thinking like that. Uh, so we can take the next question. What are the rules in the law of the sea convention for dealing with piracy? See, I'm uh, presently dealing with the uh, marine protection of marine environment. So piracy itself is a very big uh, subject. So yes, I think that's yes. a matter of another lecture. Exactly, exactly. So I think we should take another one or two questions on the topic itself. Uh, that will be better. Yes. Any, any, anybody who can ask a question uh, on the topic itself, it is welcome. Either in the chat box or uh, if you can raise your hand. Also, uh, there is a question in the chat box. May let me check it. How much part of a sea? Uh, just how much part of a sea comes under a country's power? Does a country having no coastal area can get power of another country's sea? I think Madam has answered that question. Probably the power of a coastal country uh, is in within 12 nautical miles. Am I correct, Ma'am? No, no. No. See, coastal state has uh, sovereignty over 12 nautical miles. Uh, it has sovereign rights over natural fishing resources till 200 nautical miles, which is the exclusive economic zone. And as far as uh, extended continental shelf is concerned, it can go up to 350 nautical miles. If no, the okay, okay. Article 76 are uh, complied with or uh, are applicable, then it can go with extended continental shelf can go up to 350 nautical miles. Okay, okay. Excluding the 12 nautical miles of sovereignty. Miles is sovereignty. Ah, no, that but 350 so or right. so there is a difference between sovereignty and sovereign rights. Right. So all the fish or the, the living resources which are uh, present within 200 nautical miles and the non-living resources. The coastal state has sovereign rights. So the power to exploit those resources rests with the coastal state. Okay, okay. And if the geological conditions are fulfilled, as regards as the continental shelf is concerned, uh, a state, a coastal state can have jurisdiction till its, the, the, till its continental shelf extends or up to a maximum of 315 nautical miles. Okay. Now the second part of the question is: Does a country having no coastal area can get power of another country's sea? I think uh, he cannot be because the sovereignty right is within 12 nautical no, miles. I don't think uh, another landlocked country or any country can enter. Yes, but no, not right. the 200 nautical uh, miles where the sovereignty. As I told you earlier that you know it's the right of the coastal state to exploit all the uh, living resources. That's the fish. However, if a coastal state doesn't have the capacity to utilize all its resources, then it can get into agreements with other countries through licensing arrangements to grant them the right to exploit natural resources, that, that is living resources, within its uh, area of EEZ. So it's not a general right. It is a right which is acquired within 200 nautical miles also by an agreement with the coastal state. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. We'll take the last question. Uh, I'm just reading out. Uh, if there will be, if there will between any, if there will be any restriction by any sea connected country with protected marine zones and the neighboring country uh, dumping, probably I think dumping garbage, which affects the reserve protected zone. Uh, 
what will be the steps by the country with protected marine zone? Maybe I think reframe the questions. That means if a country which doesn't have any right and it will come and dump the garbage into a uh, sovereignty area of the coastal area of another country, what will happen? Where the, where the country will go? So, you know, um, if, if uh, the kind of uh, uh, pollution or garbage or uh, is uh, dumped, then uh, there are specific, like there's a dump, London uh, dumping uh, convention, there's pollution by ships. So depending on the nature of uh, the pollution, the state parties would have to uh, have a right to, you know, approach an international forum or international dispute settlement. Okay. So, so madam, there is a very interesting question. So with these questions, I will end uh, actually. Honorable Jaw, this is from... Kenya, Victor Kenuthia, Akinuthia, a Kenyan student reading in our university. Honorable George, are all countries bound by international law or law of the law of the sea, or there are exceptions? See, every treaty depends on the consent of state parties. So uh, there are at the moment 167 state parties to the Convention on the Law of the Sea, and I think there are 192 members of the United Nations. So there is a small, a few countries which are not parties. But then some of the provisions uh, of the Convention are seen to be part of customary international law. So those provisions as customary international law are provided, are, uh, you know, uh, uh, are uh, binding on all states. You'll recall that recently ICJ has given an opinion in uh, Nic Nicaragua versus uh, Colombia case in which they have applied customary international law to see whether a state can, uh, the extended continental shelf of a state can go into the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone of an opposite state. So customary international law applies in such cases where states, one of the, you know, where states are not parties to the convention. But of course, treaties, of course, apply only to state parties because consent is one of the basis for becoming a party to a treaty. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, uh, for the great lecture that you have delivered. Uh, thank you, everybody. On behalf of the university, I am extremely grateful and thankful to you, ma'am kindly accept our thank you very much thank you very much thank you meeting is over